sitting is resumed. It is now time for question time. I must inform the House that questions number 1, 7 and 11 have been withdrawn. Now start with listed questions. A question I call Mr Roy Beggs. Mr Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All £9 million of the funding allocated to the Northern Zone has been committed to the six projects prioritised by the local steering group. Delivery is progressing at pace, with three of the projects worth almost £4.5 million now operational and providing vital support and opportunities in local communities. The Community Capacity Hubs project worth almost £1.7 million funding improvements to seven community premises has commenced. The two remaining projects focused on mental health support and fuel poverty, worth almost £2.8 million, are committed, and work is ongoing to finalise the implementation plan and commence these projects as quickly as possible. Mr Beggs for a supplementary. It is now some six years since the First Minister and Deputy First Minister first raised the idea of the Social Investment Fund. Would the First Minister agree with me that it is an indictment? that at this date in time, none of the £1.8 million allocated to uh, tackle fuel poverty has reached any of my constituents who are in urgent need, and if she were a business, she'd be out of business. Well, I have to say, Mr Speaker, the first thing I would advise the member to do is to calm down. The um, second thing I would advise the member is that this project, the Strategic Investment Fund, is, are, is making a huge, huge impact on areas right across Northern Ireland. And I am really, really disappointed to hear that the Ulster Unionists still haven't got what is actually happening in their own constituencies. What is actually happening is that we are making a real impact on uh, constituents. Uh, we're helping them through employment programmes, and indeed I was delighted uh, to be in your constituency, uh, Mr Speaker, just last week, making a very good announcement about uh, employability and allowing people to come forward and to be employed where otherwise they wouldn't have the opportunity to be so. Uh, £80 million pounds is going to be spent uh, in relation to SIF, and uh, hopefully by the time it is implemented, uh, the members in the official opposition, uh, that is the Ulster Unionist Party, because they have deigned themselves to be the official opposition, will get with the programme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Jerry Mullen. Can the First Minister provide an update on the Community Premises Support Project, which is designed to update the infrastructure of community buildings in the North West, especially in the Mavadi? Well, yes, uh, uh, if it's the Northern Zone project he's talking about, I understand there are seven community capacity hubs that are uh, going to be dealt with, and uh, there are five, I think, that are ready to go ahead. Two, however, have difficulties in relation to health and safety, uh, so the business case has been split off so that five can go ahead whilst the other two have their issues dealt with. So the project is moving ahead, and I'm very pleased to see that that is the case. Call Mr Oliver McMullen. And can I thank the Minister for answer so far? Minister, you have mentioned there is five cases uh, ready to go. Could you perhaps uh, give us an example of one of these uh, examples in the Northern Zone? Yes, they are under the Community Capacity Hubs. Money Moore, Brock Derg, Ballymcguigan Hall, Castle Dawson Hall and Coke Hall uh, are ready to proceed, but I understand that there are health and safety issues with the other two halls, but those are being dealt with proactively uh, by officials, and I have no doubt that those issues will be dealt with very quickly. Call Mr David Hildich. Mr Speaker, and the First Minister has already touched upon some of it, but can't you share of any good examples that the SIF projects are having and having a positive impact in their areas? Well, SIF um, is investing £18.5 million pounds in employment-focused projects, and I'm particularly pleased, given my background uh, in relation to that, they're currently supporting over 800 people through training uh, and paid work placements. And uh, I did have the opportunity to speak to uh, a young man who uh, was not employed. He had a real desire to get involved with uh, the technology industry. No one would employ him because he lacked experience. He hadn't had the opportunity uh, to gain qualifications within the sector. And after uh, securing a placement uh, through one of our SIF-funded employment projects, he not only gained experience and training, he also increased his confidence uh, and self-belief. And as a consequence of that, he has now secured uh, a full-time position 
with a major uh, software company, and that's exactly what it's all about. And you know, others can say, oh, this hasn't happened, that hasn't happened. We're interested in real people, the outcome that can be achieved for real people, and that's what we've been able to do with individuals such as that young man who I was speaking to. So I think SIF will become uh, a programme that we will look back and say we are very, very proud of that project. Call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I'm sure even the First Minister would accept that there have been serious problems with regards to the administration of the Social Investment Fund, and there have been a number of executive gateway reviews into that. Is she satisfied, and can she assure the House that all government protocols, particularly in relation to ending uh, paramilitary activity, have been followed in the awarding uh, of contracts on the fund? Uh, yes, and I wish the member would be more explicit into which one he's speaking about. If he's speaking about the one uh, I was at uh, last week, and I, I mean, I'll sit down if he wants to mention uh, which particular project he's referring to. No. Um, all of the SIFT programmes have been assessed uh, by civil servants. They have all passed uh, what they need to pass to be allowed to draw down the money. And I have absolutely no hesitation in saying that any of the SIF uh, money that has been awarded will be put to the use for which it has been intended. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. Uh, the panel on paramilitarism commented adversely on officialdom pandering to paramilitary groups, saying those government do business with should be consistent positive examples to their communities. So why has the management of a social investment project in East Belfast been handed over to a UDA front organisation? And how many provo front organisations are set to run SIF projects? Is this indeed what the Social Investment Fund is all about? Uh, and again, uh, he reads from the paramilitary panel report but doesn't uh, reference the part of the paramilitary panel report which says those who have been or are members of paramilitary groups but who wish to transition should be encouraged to do so. This includes the need to make sure that as many ex-offenders as possible are able to reintegrate and live peacefully and productively in society. That's what the panel report says and I'm standing by that. Call Mr Patsy McGlone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number three. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'd like to group questions three and six. Uh, as I recently stated in the chamber, while it is for the United Kingdom government to negotiate directly on the terms of our exit from the European Union, we intend to have a full and active voice in shaping the terms of those negotiations to get what is best for the people of Northern Ireland. We welcome and are determined to see fulfilled the Prime Minister's commitment to full engagement with the Executive in preparing for the negotiations and to an inclusive UK-wide approach to and objectives for those negotiations. Members will be aware that meetings have taken place with the Prime Minister and with the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union. We have also written to the Prime Minister to set our initial assessment of the particular challenges which Northern Ireland will face. Work continues in and between departments to scope and refine the nature of those challenges so that our position will be informed and supported by the best information and analysis available. Discussions have also been taking place in bilateral and multilateral format between the governments and sectoral issues and on the establishment of a formal intergovernmental forum under the auspices of the Joint Ministerial Committee to consider all issues regarding the exit negotiations. Mr. McGlone, first supplementary. Um, I, I thank the First Minister for her comments. Um, will the First Minister consider um, the use of an ad hoc assembly committee, which would oversee and scrutinise the Brexit process as it evolves and develops? Uh, will the First Minister give us an opinion on that, please? Well, I uh, thank the member for his question. Really, that's a matter uh, which the committees must take up if they decide to set up uh, some uh, committee structure. And I know that there have been occasions in the past when um, the committees have come together for a particular reason. Uh, they may well believe that that's what they want to do on this occasion, and that's a matter entirely for the committees and for this House. Call Mr. Steve Aiken. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the First Minister for your remarks. 
Uh, has the First Minister, in the view of the Prime Minister's recent comments around initiating Article 50 by the 31st of March 2017, and the Prime Minister's comments around a great repeal bill, received any written response from the co-First Minister's letter dated the 10th of August, which raises several issues that would directly bear on both triggering Article 50 and the Great Repeal Bill itself? And would she ensure, in the spirit of the openness and transparency that her government Ask is well known for, to come to his publish that response? Come to your question. We haven't received any response uh, to our letter of the 10th of August, uh, but that doesn't mean that we haven't uh, been communicating with Whitehall or indeed with our ministerial colleagues in Whitehall. Uh, here's some news for the member. Not everything is put in a letter. We do sometimes speak to each other on the telephone uh, and indeed by other mechanisms as well. Call Mr. Alex Easton. Um, could I thank the First Minister for her answer so far? Is the First Minister satisfied with the level of engagement with the UK government and does she support the triggering, triggering of Article 10 by the end of March next year? Uh, I think the member means Article 50. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what Article 10 is, but I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure some of my uh, Europhile colleagues will be able to tell me what Article 10 of the Lisbon Treaty uh, is all about. Um, in terms of uh, the engagement with uh, Her Majesty's Government, uh, that format uh, will be multi-layered. We will have, of course, multilateral uh, discussions uh, with the Irish Government, with the UK Government. Uh, we will have bilateral discussions which will take place as well, but the formal uh, ministerial discussions will take place uh, through a JMC uh, format and the Deputy First Minister and I have been very clear that we want to be directly involved in any negotiations so that we can put forward what is right for the, all of the people of Northern Ireland, uh, regardless of whether they voted to remain or voted to leave, because what we're focused on now, Mr Speaker, is what's best for the people of Northern Ireland. Yeah. Call Mr Sean Lynch. The Concord, I could I ask the Minister what discussions have taken place with the Irish, Scottish and Welsh governments of Gormagod? Well, we did have a, a very useful uh, meeting uh, during uh, the specially convened BIC, uh, which took place uh, in July. Uh, negotiations, as I say, and, and discussions will continue uh, bilaterally and multilaterally. And I've no doubt that uh, when the uh, Joint Ministerial Council date is set, and we believe that that will be set uh, relatively soon, uh, that we will continue to discuss matters with our Scottish, Welsh, and indeed with our Republic of Ireland colleagues as well. Mr. Speaker, um, the Prime Minister's announcement at the weekend not only accelerated the Brexit process, but it also made it clear uh, that access to the single market and retention of it would not be a priority. How does the First Minister feel that will impact on business in Northern Ireland, given the degree to which we trade with the Republic of Ireland? Uh, and I thank the member for her question. It is uh, a very core question and one that uh, will continue to be at the core of the negotiations, I have no doubt, over the next period of time. And whilst access to the single market uh, is important, we should also uh, recall and remember, and sometimes people try to wipe the slate on this uh, issue, uh, that the, if the Euro we were still members of the European Union continuing, uh, we would have to deal with the issue of domestic water charges. Uh, we would have to deal with the ever inflexibility uh, in relation to attracting foreign direct investment. And if the member will allow me, I will answer the question. I know she's always in a rush, but give me a minute. Um, and also that we would have to deal with state aid rules uh, as well. Um, but the negotiations will be long, they will be protracted, uh, and uh, we as a country uh, should not be lacking in our ambitions. And I've, I've listened to some uh, of the disparate members of, of the opposition uh, making the case that we should set out uh, in solid stone what our negotiation uh, should be. Well, I never heard such nonsense in all my life. Did, uh, well, indeed, <laughs> it just shows what good negotiators they are. You do not set out your hand before you enter into negotiations. I'm not going to undercut uh, the negotiating hand of the Northern Ireland Executive before we actually start in, the, in relation to these matters. Uh, 
I'm sorry, there's a bit of noise coming from the, the naughty <laughs> corner. Uh, it is in everyone's uh, interest to make the transition as uh, smooth as possible. And in doing so, we will work with the Republic of Ireland's government and we will work with colleagues in Scotland, Wales and the UK government as well. Uh, and that's where we are at the moment and that's where we will continue to push ahead for what is right for the people of Northern Ireland. Call Mr Stephen Ignuya. Given that the people of Northern Ireland voted to remain, will the First Minister give a commitment that there will be no uh, Northern Ireland Great Repeal Bill? And in fact, can she outline what work has been done by the Executive to ensure existing EU laws are enshrined locally? Well, we will not be passing a Great Repeal Bill because that is a matter for the Westminster uh, yeah, Parliament. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, and uh, they are sovereign in all of these matters, uh, as indeed colleagues in Scotland and Wales have had to face up to. And there are some members in this chamber who still have not faced up to the fact that the vote taken on the 23rd of June was a vote taken right across the United Kingdom. Right across the United Kingdom. Uh, and I still hear this about how uh, Northern Ireland voted to remain. Northern Ireland is part, a constituent part of the United Kingdom and we were all asked the question whether we wanted the United Kingdom to remain or to leave and we all voted and the vote has been taken. So now let's get on with it and deal with consequences yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Members, uh, before I come to ask Mr George Robinson, I would like to extend a welcome to the Right Honourable Ikwi Ithuru, Speaker of the Senate of Kenya, and an accompanying delegation who are currently visiting the Northern Ireland Assembly. You are all very welcome indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Call Mr George Robinson. Question four, Mr Speaker. Having just returned from the United States, I can testify to the ability of the Northern Ireland Bureau in Washington to represent our interests at the highest level in partnership with Invest Northern Ireland and Tourism Ireland. That strong working bond between those three offices ensures maximum impact not just in the United States but also in Canada. In the two years that it has been operational, the Executive Bureau in Beijing has established excellent working relations with key national and provincial government bodies. I am looking forward to developing this relationship with the Deputy First Minister and I ch visit China in December of this year. Mr Robinson for a supplementary. Mr Speaker, thank the uh, First Minister for her answer. Would the First Minister agree that these Bureau will play an increasingly important role in attracting investment and jobs to all areas of Northern Ireland, including the northwest of the province? Uh, I thank the member for his uh, question. Indeed, and, uh, the Bureau provides a critical uh, role for all of the people of Northern Ireland. Yes, they do host executive ministers and uh, assembly delegations when they go to the United States. I'm speaking about the Washington Bureau now. Uh, but they also have actually provided, uh, host, been a host uh, to many delegations that have come across from Northern Ireland, whether they're school delegations, <coughs> delegations from our universities, business delegations, and they absolutely uh, provide a, a, a very clear view as to what's happening in the United States uh, and also try and influence and bring forward the, what is happening here uh, in Northern Ireland, in modern day Northern Ireland, because I think that's very important that people have an understanding of what's going on here now. And so the Deputy First Minister and I will go to China uh, at the beginning of December. Uh, we will open our office in Beijing and also uh, use that office uh, to make further contacts and further inroads uh, uh, into the Chinese market and we are very much looking forward to doing that. We had a good opportunity to speak with uh, our Consul General, Madam Wang, last week. Uh, they are looking forward to hosting us in China and we hope it will be a very successful visit. Call Ms Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I ask the First Minister, how will these offices be affected by the departure of Stephen Grimison? They will not be. Call Mr. Philip McGuigan. Can, uh, can I ask the First Minister, uh, just going beyond the two specific bureaus, if she could comment on the importance uh, of international relations in terms of our economic development? 
Well, it is critically important that we continue to go across the world to sell Northern Ireland as a good place uh, not only to invest in, uh, but also to visit as well. And I'm pleased to say that the Economy Minister uh, is currently in the Middle East, continuing to build uh, those links uh, that have been developing over a period of time now. Uh, and of course, Invest Northern Ireland have a range of offices right across the globe, uh, as well as Tourism Ireland, who, as you know, uh, sell Northern Ireland uh, across the world as a tourist destination. And what a story they have to tell uh, now as well, a very positive story uh, about Northern Ireland, uh, about the fact that Titanic Centre uh, is now Europe's leading visitor attraction. How wonderful is that to be able to tell? The fact that the Game of Thrones uh, is, is, happens here in Northern Ireland, the multi-award winning Game of Thrones, winning more Emmys than any other programme uh, in history. Uh, and as well as that, the fact that Northern Ireland is globally number one when it comes to financial technology investment, number one in the world. Uh, now, that's not something you're going to see in an opposition uh, press statement, but it's something I'll talk about all day long. Which opposition? <laughs> call Mr. Stephen Farry. In her last answer, the Minister uh, referred to the Executive having a negotiate in the hand in relation to Brexit. That belies what she has just said uh, today in the Chamber, uh, in contrast to what the Deputy First Minister actually said today outside this room. How can we make best use of our diplomats in Brussels, in Washington and, and Beijing if we don't give them a strong, coherent position in relation uh, to Brexit, particularly when people internationally are very keen to help Northern Ireland in light of our experience with the peace process? Well, as someone who has just come back from the United States, I want to tell the member that it's not actually all about Brexit. It's not actually all about Brexit. It is about the fact that we continue to have and he should know this, uh, being the former skills minister, uh, the raw talent here which people are looking for. Uh, we have the value. We have the fact that our attrition rates are very low. And come April 2018, we will have corporation tax devolved uh, to Northern Ireland. So we will have the talent, we will have the value, and we will have the tax. And none of that, none of that is dependent on our position in the European Union. Call Mr Barry McElduff. Uh, question number five, Kesh Devrakuig. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Ross to answer this question. Thank you. The number of actions have been taken immediately after the referendum. As a member will be aware, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister provided assurances to our valued migrant minority ethnic communities in a joint statement, and we continue to work towards a society of welcome and belonging. In September, Junior Minister Farron and myself launched the Community Relations and Cultural Awareness Week, supported by the Executive Office, which brought together communities through the Arts Open Days and discussion. And our officials are in contact with representatives from the EU migrant communities to help them <coughs> assert their rights and continue our long-standing relationship of appreciation and respect. We can assure people from European countries and other migrants living here that they are very much welcome and valued in Northern Ireland. Mr. McElduff for a supplementary. Uh, can I take this opportunity to commend uh, in my own constituency the work of organisations in both Oma and Straban, ethnic community support groups, um, tremendous work that they do. But could I further ask the Minister to detail what plans the Executive has in place uh, to make life easier and more fulfilled for child refugees? Well, as the member will be aware, um, we have currently had 200 refugees coming to Northern Ireland and Belfast, and Derry and Craig Avon. I had the opportunity to meet with uh, one of those uh, individuals who has relocated to Northern Ireland quite recently in uh, an event in Dungannon. I must say I was incredibly encouraged by the fact that he has found Northern Ireland a very welcoming place, although it's difficult to come to a new country, he's found it a very welcoming place. Uh, in terms specifically of child refugees, we're aware of the Home Office plans to establish a resettlement scheme for refugee children at risk. Uh, there's a range of complex issues to consider regarding the resettlement of children. The UN and other humanitarian charities are clear that efforts to reunite children with relatives of extended family should be given priority. Uh, in most cases, this means that they should remain in the region to improve their chances of being reunited with their families. We have demonstrated our commitment to ass uh, assisting with the humanitarian uh, crisis through the executive participation in the resettlement of refugees, including families with children, through the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme. And that scheme is the first formal refugee resettlement program in which the executive has participated. Uh, we'll consider what role we may play uh, in any plans to resettle child refugees once more detailed proposals emerge. And this would include an assessment of our capacity to meet with the specific needs of child refugees. Call Ms. Claire Hannah. 
Speaker, and I thank the Minister um, for his answers. If, uh, as indicated by our conference speech yesterday, Theresa May, who is less squeamish than this government about revealing her plan to the extent that she has one, um, if it does uh, look like we're going towards a hard Brexit, will this executive advocate on behalf of those citizens to, who are currently working here from other EU countries to protect their freedom of movement and to protect the interests of the Northern Irish businesses that rely so heavily on migrant labour? We've already moved to reassure those uh, EU migrants living in Northern Ireland that they are very much welcome and we're helping them uh, understand their, their, uh, the rights that they have. As the members will know, immigration is a reserved matter, so it's not uh, a matter for the Northern Ireland Assembly. However, of course, the uh, immigration policy will have an impact in practical terms in terms of many of the companies living in, in Northern Ireland. That is exactly why the First and Deputy First Minister wrote in the, letter, the joint letter to the, the, the Prime Minister indicating the uh, priorities that we have from a Northern Ireland perspective and the importance of having migrant workers for many key industries, including the agri, uh, uh, the agri sector here in Northern Ireland. So that will be continuing part of the uh, discussions that we have with Her Majesty's Government. Call Mr. Doug Beattie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Um, can the, the Minister outline how many attacks have been recorded targeting members of the black uh, and minority communities since the EU referendum? I thank the member for, for raising this issue. I'm, I'm also pleased to say that, unlike in England and Wales, Northern Ireland hasn't seen a spike in terms of racially motivated attacks against our ethnic uh, communities. Indeed, the general trajectory is one of, of a decreasing number of attacks. That said, we can't be complacent in this issue. Too many attacks uh, are still happening, and we want to make sure that we continue to work with the Justice Minister and work with the PSNI to ensure that there's no toleration given towards those sorts of attacks. We have a racial equality strategy and a racial equality group uh, met last month for the first time. They'll be meeting again on the 8th of November. And what we're doing uh, collaboratively with those ethnic minorities groups is, is recognising and identifying what their key needs are and how we can ensure that we continue to work towards creating not just a tolerant Northern Ireland, but one that actually celebrates diversity and the cultural richness that we have now in the modern Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Christopher Stanford. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, will the Minister be aware of the Comrades research which found that 77 per cent of Leave voters wanted to ensure that the status of EU migrants was protected post the referendum? Would the Minister also agree that it is essential that uh, we move forward from the referendum united as a community in condemnation of all those who would engage in such attacks? Well, of course, I, I absolutely do, and I must say, in some of the work that I have been doing in this department, has allowed me to go out and see some of the sort of activities that are going on with ethnic minorities across Northern Ireland. I had the privilege of helping to launch, along with Junior Minister Fern, the Community Relations and Cultural Awareness Week. Uh, that was a fabulous week of activities. Over 160 events took place across Northern Ireland um, that allowed uh, ethnic minorities to come together. Uh, explain more about what their own cultures are and, and allow uh, those conversations to take place. And I'm also assured by listening to comments directly from some of the ethnic minority groups and from some of the refugees who have come and, and created a new life in Northern Ireland of how welcoming they have found Northern Ireland. And I think that's something that we should all be immensely proud of. Call Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Can I ask the Minister if he heard his party colleague um, Gregory Campbell on the Nolan Show this morning when he was talking about allies in Hungary and if so, does he think it is credible, credible for the DUP to talk about these allies given the track record of Orban and Jobnik on refugees and if he hasn't heard it, I am happy to read it out to him. Well, no, I didn't. I don't make a habit of listening to the Northern Show. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. it's, better, it's better for my health in that way, uh, but I will sure yeah, be sure to have a look at the transcript afterwards. Is it work, Call Mr William Humphrey. Uh, Speaker, uh, call the, uh, sorry, question number eight. Uh, we plan to visit China in December to meet with senior national and provincial government leaders. Uh, these strategic meetings will help us realise our objective for China of developing trade and investment connections, encouraging tourism, attracting students and developing research partnerships. I have just returned from a visit to the United States where I met with potential investors, international lawyers and with tourism industry representatives to promote Northern Ireland. The Deputy First Minister is scheduled to, meet, to visit the United States in early November. Mr Humphrey for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank the First Minister for her answer. If, can I ask the First Minister, given her uh, meeting last week with the uh, consulate to the Chinese consulate to Northern Ireland, can I ask, has the Brexit vote and the determination of the British people across this United Kingdom had any effect negatively on what her discussions? No, certainly not uh, with China. Uh, as he will know, uh, we have long been working with China to develop 
uh, a relationship there. And if anyone knows anything about uh, doing business in China, they will know uh, that you have to build up uh, a relationship uh, with the government, both at central and at local level. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say that uh, Belfast City Council has now full sister city status with Shenyang, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the cities that the Deputy First Minister and I will be visiting uh, in December. And we look forward to doing very good business out there in December when we go. Members, that ends the period for listed questions. We now move to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Ms Nicola Mullen. Mr. Speaker, um, can I ask the First Minister why she kept the Brexit research paper produced for before the referendum hidden from the people of Northern Ireland? I'm very pleased that the member has <coughs> asked that question today because I want to put a few things on the record, Mr. Speaker. First of all, this paper was not commissioned by me. It was not commissioned by my predecessor. Uh, it only uh, came to my attention uh, when a, a Freedom of Information request. Uh, come in earlier uh, this year. Uh, it, the, the, the document was not seen by me, uh, and indeed, on speaking to the head of the civil service uh, just today, because he's been on leave uh, for a period of time, so it was the first opportunity I had to speak to the head of the civil service to get to the bottom of this issue. Uh, he said, when I asked him why it hadn't been brought to my attention, uh, he said, well, I wouldn't have brought it to your attention as it wasn't completed. And yet, Somehow, this document has become something uh, that I stopped going out uh, for uh, some reason, uh, and it never actually came to me, uh, nor did it come to my predecessor. It was something that was initiated by the head of the civil service, uh, and I would have thought that members opposite, despite the fact that they're in the opposition, know full well that civil servants do from time to time pass around papers between them uh, and commission papers between them, but it's not something that came to my desk. Ms Mullen, first supplementary. Um, can the First Minister confirm then whether the Deputy First Minister suggested publishing this report or at least sharing it with other executive colleagues as outlined in an interview with the BBC? Well, I didn't hear uh, that interview uh, uh, in relation to what the Deputy First Minister had to say, but the document uh, certainly did not come to me. I, I will let the Deputy First Minister answer whether the document uh, came to him. I'm not aware of it having uh, gone to him, uh, but uh, it certainly didn't come to me. It was written, as I understand it, by two civil servants within a department, the European Policy Branch. It wasn't initiated by a minister, it was initiated inside the civil service, and everybody needs to calm down about this so-called Brexit paper. Call Mr Danny Kennedy. Sure. Can the First Minister outline uh, what view she has expressed to both the Prime Minister and the Brexit Minister on the issue of what is described as a hard border between ourselves and the Irish Republic once the UK leave the EU? Well, you know, there are times I wish over this past 40 years that we had a hard border between ourselves and the Republic of Ireland. Times when people were being murdered at will along the border, but there was no hard border. And I, I find it very difficult to understand why those people who voted Remain, who still don't get that we, as the United Kingdom, voted to leave the European Union, who some people are calling Remoners, of course I wouldn't use that sort of terminology, cannot get cannot get that the only people who are talking about a hard border are people who voted to remain. Nobody on this side of the House is talking about a hard border. Nobody is talking about a hard border. They want us to fail. What, you know, I don't know whether some people have become fascinated with Donald Trump's wall, <laughs> but we don't want a wall built along. Some people may. I don't want a wall built along uh, the border with the Republic of Ireland. What we want to see is uh, the maximum number of movement between uh, ourselves and the Republic of Ireland. We want a sensible way forward. I'm working for a sensible way forward, but there are plenty of other people in this Assembly who keep talking up uh, issues that are not even on the agenda. Mr Kennedy for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr uh, Speaker. Slightly disappointed at the tone uh, the First Minister seems to be adopting. <laughs> can, I, can I ask that might she, uh, when, when she's swilling the champagne at the Conservative Party conference <laughs> later, later this week, at least try to ensure 
that any future arrangements around border controls are not simply created at Great Britain's ports and airports? Well, it only took to 25 to 3 to get that one in. Uh, I can assure the member that non-alcoholic drinks will also be available. Yeah. At the in case he wants to come along, just in case. I'm not made it. <laughs> well, that's true. That's, that's true. That's, that's part of the problem, problem, of course, because uh, we're listening to jilted lovers and their reaction <laughs> to the way in which they're dealing with you the Conservative come. Party now. We all remember you, Comf. Well, sorry, those people who were in the Ulster Unionist Party remember you, Comf, at that particular yeah. time. There are many on the benches, of course, who weren't in the party at that particular time. Um, can I say, uh, Mr Speaker, of course I will be representing the best interests of the people of Northern Ireland as I go to Birmingham. Uh, I will be giving uh, a very good uh, account of what's happening in Northern Ireland, the fact that we are an open regional economy and want to remain an open regional economy within the United Kingdom, to take all of the benefits of our membership of the United Kingdom, but also to benefit from our good relationship with the Republic of Ireland's government, uh, which will continue post-Brexit. Call Ms Linda Dillon. Could the Minister outline what plans you have to engage with the Irish and British governments and the EU Commission with a view to overcoming the funding logjam, which is holding up European EU peace funding? Yes, I understand the Finance Minister uh, mentioned this last week uh, in his question, the fact that uh, whilst we have over £120 million pounds, uh, sorry, euros of letters of offer for cross-border uh, transformative job, environmental and health projects, uh, that some of those have become log-jammed in the system. Let me be very clear. Uh, the Executive, the Finance Department, the Special EU Peace Body and Interreg panels have all stepped up to expedite uh, those funding applications. In fact, I think they have put in an awful lot of work to ensure that the money uh, is released uh, to all of those who are involved with peace work and creating jobs on the ground. Uh, but respectfully, I would suggest that their efforts do need to be matched, do need to be matched by those in the Irish government, uh, from our own government, and indeed from the European Union Commission as well. And we will, of course, uh, support the Finance Minister as he tries to push those organisations in the correct direction. Call Ms Dillon for a supplementary. In the absence of a resolution, what plans do the Executive have, have the Executive put any plans in place to sustain projects that are relying on the peace fund? Well, of course, uh, we're not there yet, and what we want to do is to ensure that the peace funding, um, as you know, uh, the uh, Chancellor has indicated that anything that is uh, signed off before the autumn statement will be honoured. Uh, I think that's a very good indicator. It has given some time uh, so that groups and indeed the SAUPB can have those offers in place. Uh, for those offers that are not in place after that date, I understand that the Finance Minister is continuing his negotiations with Treasury in relation to those, mat in relation to those matters, and of course we will support him in those efforts. I must inform the members that question number four has been withdrawn. I call Mr Jerry Kelly. Could the uh, First Minister tell us what herself and uh, what plans are in place for herself and the Deputy First Minister uh, to deal with the recommendations of the Heart Inquiry? Indeed, uh, as I understand it, uh, Mr Justice Hart is currently writing his uh, long-awaited um, uh, judgment in relation to the hearings that he has listened to very empathetically in Bambridge Courthouse. Uh, we look forward to receiving that judgment, we believe, early next year, uh, and then, of course, we will give it due consideration. <coughs> Call Mr Kelly for a supplementary. Um, does the First Minister believe that the panel of redress uh, should be established to meet the needs of the victims and survivors of the uh, historic and uh, institutional abuse? Well, uh, there has been many calls in relation to panel of redress, and I can understand why that would be the case, um, not least the fact that uh, the victims are not getting any younger. Um, but we do not want to prejudge what uh, Mr Justice Hart will say to us uh, in his judgment, and, because he may well have uh, decided, and I don't know whether he has or not, which particular form of redress should take, uh, what the process should be around that. He may, on the ha other hand, just leave it up to us to decide on what redress uh, should happen. So I don't want to uh, prejudge what Mr Justice Hart has said, and I know 
Uh, there are many victims who would want us to move ahead on this, but this is now October. Uh, we accept the report, expect the report uh, in January or February of next year, and when we get that, we do give this assurance that we will not sit on that report, but we will deal with the consequences of it as quickly as we can. Call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Mr. Speaker, the First Minister will, will be aware of recent talk around the whole issue of legacy. Could the First Minister inform the House what engagement she has had with groups on this issue? Yes, indeed. Uh, this is an issue which is still very much to the fore. Uh, and I can tell the member that I continue to have very useful engagements right across Northern Ireland uh, with victims' groups. I recently met with Decor MNI uh, in Bangor. I met with uh, the Middlester group uh, along with Keith Buchanan just last week. Uh, and indeed, I was with uh, a group from the Ulster Special Constabulary Association just yesterday. So I will continue to engage with those victims' groups as we move towards trying to deal with the legacy of the past. Call Mr. Douglas for a supplementary. Thank you, First Minister, for answers uh, thus far. Um, could I ask the First Minister how important does she feel that the resolution on this matter should be reached uh, before autumn? Well, I hope that we are moving to a resolution of this matter. I know that the Secretary of State has indicated that he would like to uh, consult with the wider community on the way forward, uh, probably in the autumn time. We look forward to uh, him doing that so that we can have a, an open uh, and transparent look at what he is suggesting. Uh, it is very important, of course, that whatever comes out of that, that there can be no rewriting of what happened in the past, that the past uh, stands on its own facts and that people do not try to spin what happened in the past in a particular direction. Uh, and therefore, I do hope that we get to a situation where we have a holistic way of dealing with the past, uh, because until we do, uh, there will be various attempts to try and rewrite the past, and that's something I certainly will not stand for. Call Mr. Chris Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I give the First Minister another opportunity to address the question of how important it is for businesses in Northern Ireland to have access to the single market? Well, you know, I know that the Alliance Party are very exercised today, and we can hear the noise from them up here, even we are at the opposite end of the chamber. I have answered the question about the single market. I have said. You see, um, I have said that we will continue to work with businesses, and unlike the Alliance Party, the Deputy First Minister and I are speaking directly to members of the business communities. We had a very good engagement with the Chamber of Commerce just last week when there were uh, disparate voices from all around the province, from all sorts of different sectors. It was a very good engagement. We will continue to listen to their concerns. And you know what's wrong for the Alliance Party to say that we haven't raised this issue? It's one of the very key issues that we raised in our letter of the 10th of August to the the Prime Minister. So it's wrong to say that we aren't representing the business community in Northern Ireland. Very wrong indeed. Call Mr. Little for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think if anyone's getting exercised in here today, it appears to be the First Minister, to be honest with you. Um, it's clear that many businesses in Northern Ireland are asking what uh, Brexit will mean for them. They are concerned about access to the single market, and they believe it is uh, vitally important to our economy. So what reassurances can she give to those businesses that she does have an alternative plan if indeed she does not believe it is as important as they do? I didn't say I didn't think it was important. Of course it's important that businesses have access uh, to their markets. That's why we raised it in the letter of the 10th of August. And if the member wants, I'll do him up a specially gilded copy of the letter of the 10th of August and send it to his office. Call Mr Gary Middleton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the First Minister what her views are on the recent uh, motion passed by, by the Council of London and Straban in relation to uh, calling on news agents not to uh, sell the Sun newspaper? Well, can I say it's a very retrograde step uh, when you try to, and many of us have been the subject of uh, investigations and scrutiny by the press, and that's what they do, that's what their job is. Um, and I think it's wrong for us to say uh, that we should boycott one paper or another. And can I take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to absolutely condemn the threatening behaviour directed towards not only Father Gary Donegan, but to a journalist 
on Saturday uh, morning when he was only doing his job uh, up in North Belfast. I think it's absolutely scandalous uh, that anyone should have to be faced with that sort of threatening, intimidating behaviour, and I want to send out a very strong message that it's simply not acceptable. Call Mr. Middleton for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the first I, I welcome the uh, response from the First Minister, and she has, uh, in part, answered my supplementary. Uh, but I suppose if she would give um, some uh, assurance that uh, she will do all she can within her department uh, to ensure that uh, Londonderry and Shaban is well represented, even if the Council at this minute in time is focused in other areas. And I have to say, I was alarmed to see uh, the motion in relation to Israel. Uh, that was put forward in that council as well, particularly at a time when Jews in Belfast were told by the rabbi are feeling very intimidated and feeling under attack. And I think the council should reflect on that uh, because we've heard a lot from other parties in this assembly uh, about equality, about non-discrimination and about making sure everybody feels at home in Northern Ireland. Well, what about the Jewish people? Have they not got a right to feel at home yeah. in Northern Ireland as well? And I say to them, they are very welcome and they're a very key part of the community here in Northern Ireland. Members, that concludes the questions to the First Minister.